with um, a prayer. And um, this is actually the hymn for the Feast of the Ascension. From the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. O Christ, our God, you ascended in glory and gladdened your disciples by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Your blessing assured them that you are the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we left off with Acts 18, where St. Paul was leaving, um, he was leaving Athens, um, and we heard that Dionysios, who is now known as St. Dionysios the Areopagite, and Damaris were followers of his, while others thought that, you know, they could be open to hearing his message again in the future. Um, they didn't fully dismiss what he had to say. So tonight we'll hear about Paul returning to Ephesus. Um, interestingly enough, as, as you mentioned before, Harry, I, I don't know if there's some a nice movie, let's say, on Acts of the Apostles, but there is a, a nice movie. I've seen just brief parts of it, but perhaps we could uh, do a, a virtual or maybe in-person movie night um, that is on the life of St. Paul. Oh. And it's, it's called Paul, Apostle of Christ. It can be found on YouTube, um, I think Amazon Prime. Uh, so that might be an interesting one. There are a few that have to do with the Bible that I, I think are well done. Like there's one on the Gospel of John where it almost follows, almost verbatim parts of it. And, and you can see kind of play out. Sarah, have you seen that one? I, ha I, I have that one. Yeah, oh, I, I have it. Yeah, I really like how that one was done. Now, some of the, um, uh, what is it? Some of the movies that are done on the Bible or on uh, mm -hmm. kind of these figures from the Bible are a little uh, they're distorted. They're, they're uh, distorted. Yeah. yeah, you know, and and one I think which you know people were were outraged by were the. Um, Temptations of Christ, I think that one that came out years ago. Right, yes, I remember that one. So, you know, there have been some that are pretty favorable, like the Ten Commandments that came out many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these that I've seen for myself. I know there was a mini series that came out not too long ago called The, the One or The Chosen One. I forgot exactly, but it was, I think, a six part mini series. And some of my, my brother clergy have seen and, you know, watched it with their, their Goya. Um, they said that that was pretty well done. But was the one on John? Was that John of Patmos? Was that Patmos? Uh, is that uh, the one? That was a separate. That was a good one too. On finding, um, I remember th there was one, uh, kind of an archaeological film on the island of Patmos. Is that the one? I, I think you know that's the one I'm uh, referencing, but uh, um, I don't think I've seen any others. I haven't seen Paul, that's for sure, but uh, I didn't even know they made a movie on, on the life of Paul. Yeah, the, this other one was based on the actual gospel written by St. John. And so it follows you know, the apostles interaction with Jesus and his ministry. Um, this, the one you're mentioning, I think, uh, was very good. It was on kind of finding uh, some some relics and remnants of St. John when he was on Patmos. The cave, yeah, he was, yeah. I remember the cave where he and had the, the chalice, I think that, that yeah. yeah. And did they claim, Father, that they found his bones or am I mistaking? No, I think you're right. Um, there's a, a, a lot of claim for, for St. John on the island of Patmos. Hmm. Um, so I haven't heard anything you know, disputing uh, and Sarah, the film that you have, which which one was that? Was it's called the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. Okay. I can, and, I can and use like it. Father said, it's pretty much word for word. Yeah. And those are nice. You hate to watch something that is you see it with history or sometimes movies that purport to be historical in nature and they've <laughs> they've really corrupted it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, if you're a student. And you, you get that sort of information, you're going to go down the wrong path of actually knowing uh, the accuracy of the history. <laughs> right. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, so let's begin. 
Um, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So th this reception of the Holy Spirit, this is similar to the reference of Pentecost that had been re uh, the Holy Spirit being received by the apostles. Um, and, and this this early uh, receiving of the Holy Spirit kind of way, led way to um, the anointing of chrism when we are uh, baptized and chrismated um, and then given you know, our, our uh, Eucharist for the first time that this chrism represents the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit that we now share in this belonging to the Holy Spirit as well. So they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. You know, the, the interesting thing about Paul laying his hands on them, it's almost as if not only they're being baptized into the faith, but they're being ordained at the same time. And so this is um, what is being said here, I don't think is actually the laying on of hands like we see in other places. Um, what, what this is is similar to, um, what can I say? Just slipped my mind. Um, I think more more similarly to how I was just saying about the anointing, like when when one is uh, after one is baptized, one is given the seal of the Holy Spirit. Uh, something else came to mind, and I, I forgot, so I'm sorry. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew with the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia had heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. We hear a hardening of the hearts. And it's similar to the way that you know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And at times we hear that there is this type of disposition. Um, we could say, okay, is that they're them hardening themselves against the word of God because they don't want to believe? Is this an act of God intervening and hardening their hearts because they don't have this fertile soil in order to cultivate his word and to do good with it? Perhaps it's a protective measure of the actual church to not have these people who are very resistant, very adamant against what the apostles are teaching um, from doing further harm. And we also hear that Paul spent quite a bit of time here. So we hear he was in the synagogue for three months. Uh, when he commits himself to a region, he doesn't just go there for a day typically. He'll stay a minimum of a few weeks because he's building a relationship. It's not just he's needing more time to speak, but he's building a relationship with the people so that with this, with this connection, um, th they're seeing that there's something more to what he is preaching because this is transmitted partially through the, the relationship, not just hearing the word. Uh, and that, that's one of the fundamental differences that we're seeing between just regular teaching in the synagogue and that of Paul and the disciples of Christ that were actually trying to bring in the multitude. And uh, also to one of your points from earlier, Harry, um, about their traveling, acts you know, kind of took place over the course of a few years. Um, somewhere between, I think, let's say five and eight years covering you know, most of their journey. Um, at this point, I think it's already, let's say four to five, um, since this is a year and a, a quarter. And I think Paul, um, his time in Greece was a few months. And before that, was, we heard that it was about a year or two traveling in Asia Minor. 
So it, it did take some time. It seems like it happened very quickly, but we're kind of getting the, the highlights. Uh, okay, did one of you wanna take over a little bit? Sarah? Sure, I'll be happy to read. Yes, please. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish priest who, who did so. I just wanted to, to stop and point out that the, the handkerchiefs and aprons were being used as instruments of healing. Um, in, in the Orthodox Church, and I know also in the Catholic Church, sometimes there are relics that are not exactly the bones or fragments of, of a saint's body, um, but actually parts of their clothing, parts of, you know, what they, if they were um, cordial, what they liturgized with, maybe a book, maybe a cross, a blessing cross. Um, and for other saints, it could have been, you know, materials that touched their body. Um, I know, you know, even in parts of Greece, kind of depending on where the relics are, or especially where some of the walking saints are, like in Kefalonia, in Zakynthos, and the Ionian, oftentimes, um, like the little prayer ropes, things are blessed over the body of the saint. And this is because even coming into contact with holiness, we believe that these these instruments, it's not that they themselves are, um, let's say, sanctified. They become a conduit by which, you know, the blessing can be transmitted. Um, and that's why there are things like the crosses in church that we kiss. It's not because we're, you know, we're worshiping, we're venerating the cross because of what it, it represents and also the power that we believe comes from these instruments and what they touch and what they convey. Um, so th this is a, an interesting note here that just even items that are coming into contact now with St. Paul are helping to bring about healing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we hear about the way in which others are using the name of Jesus to cast out spirits. But let's see what happens next. And the, <clears throat> the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Okay, so we have the, this kind of a, a abuse of power of these, these um, individuals who wanted to use the name of Jesus to exercise the spirits, but they didn't have the heart to actually do it, or the belief. They wanted to do it almost as if, um, to kind of prove a point. And even if it wasn't to prove that there is no power in the name of Jesus, even if they wanted to say, well, you know, we can try it too. It was almost equal to blasphemy because they were using it um, as a, as trickery. And so the spirit, it's very interesting that every time we encounter a spirit um, that they know Jesus Christ, they know the disciples of Christ. Here they say, Paul, Paul, we know. So even Paul has a reputation among the spirits. And it's very interesting that at times we see that, uh, especially those in the synagogues or the religious, don't know about Jesus or don't believe that he is who they say he is. But the spirits always know. And, and it's an important recognition here um, that they're in this spiritual realm there is full understanding of who the person of Christ is. Um, and so then they were attacked because they were using his name uh, really without this, this disposition of heart, believing also that 
Jesus was the one working these miracles. They thought that they were just by saying the magic spell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so then after this, we, we see uh, a historical book burning. I, I was really struck by this part. Uh, but this isn't the first time that we heard about these magicians, let's say those who practice kind of the uh, cultic practice not just within the Greco-Roman religion, but there were cultic practices throughout, you know, the entire empire at the time. And this, this public display of casting out what once was kind of the, the re- accepted religion or one of the accepted religions of the people, uh, especially because, and they noted here, the value of the books. And, and this would have been seen almost as scandalous, just, you know, First off, someone being able to have books in those days meant that they were part of a certain class. Mm -hmm. And second, that they were openly burning them to say, we renounce uh, our our previous affiliation and we are turning towards the Lord. Mm -hmm. And you could say, well, it would have been good maybe if they sold the books instead and kept the 50,000 pieces of silver, but it's better off that they burned them because they were heretical, what, what they were practicing. You want to read a little more about the riot? Okay. When these things were accomplished, Paul pur- Paul purposed in the spirit or proposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. And I I haven't found what I think it might just be that Diana is a Latinization of um, Artemis, for whatever reason that she's a Diana. It was a Roman Roman counterpart. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. okay. Um, So this is, again, a, a... in the, in the, in the practice. Yeah, that was the, it, she was part of their pantheon of. Uh, ah. Very good. All okay. Right. Can I, can, shall I continue? Please, please, yeah. Okay. Um, he called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. The interesting thing is they never actually mention... um, the like the interaction of the goddess herself they're not saying oh she may be displeased and they're they're talking simply even in this this you know pagan faith about the things why because they're the craftsmen it's all about the money exactly (laughs) and so as we've seen previously with the the oracle that they were disappointed about paul casting out the demon it was because they were losing money. So we see these, these, early, these early trades that are not focused about the, you know, focused on the religion itself or really defending against Christianity. It's just about their business. And we could kind of see today how this would play out in a political way where one party is playing over the other about a particular issue, not because they truly care, but because they're getting the taxpayer dollars for whatever is voted in. Mm-hmm. So now they're after Paul because he's stealing their business. Mm-hmm. Now, when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, uh, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, 
sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. Sure. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice, they cried out for two for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Wow. Time and time again, we see this crowd mentality. Some of them aren't even understanding why they're there. They're confused. They're yelling. Imagine yelling for two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Meanwhile, most of the city was already taken by, by Paul and the disciples by the message. Mm -hmm. However, a few who had, let's say, um, uh, what's the word? They, had, they were stakeholders, were shareholders in, in the business of the city, um, were, were trying to turn the people against uh, Paul and the disciples out of appeasing their, their, their deity. They really didn't say that they gave a darn about Diana. Again, they were stirring the pot because they were self-interested. Uh, Harry, you want to take over a little? Okay. Uh, and, when, and when the city clerk quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana? and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he said, and when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. At times, and typically after we hear about these, you know, early riots, there is, there's often um, this reminder of due process, of justice, of what is reasonable for the Romans. This isn't uh, because th there was, there was a law by which they had to follow, and so these local officials, these proconsuls, were responsible for keeping the peace. And so it didn't really matter if the locals were upset and you know defending their goddess, even if she was considered a Roman goddess, because he's saying that there's really no charges that we can stand by. They're not blaspheming her and saying she she's a false goddess. You need to believe in this man um, Jesus, who we're saying is the Lord. And they they weren't destroying the temple. They weren't showing any sacrilege or, or disrespect. Um, they're saying, well, you got to watch your step. <laughs> there, there's really no need for, for this type of uproar because they didn't do anything wrong. Right. This also shows in some respect, um, in parts of the empire, there was this civil liberty uh, of, uh, or re freedom of religion to an extent. Now, at the same time, this didn't last very long. It didn't last in many parts of the empire because already by the end of the first century, there were, uh, not even the end, by, let's say, 60 AD, Christians were already being kicked out of Rome, as we read about a few chapters ago. And we hear more about this in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, because he speaks about how many of them were gone for a few years at this point. Um, so, Father, at this point in time, uh, uh, I'm wondering now, it had to be Augustus would have been the Roman emperor more than likely uh, in, in, in Rome. Yes. Okay. And, and would Paul, uh, would he have been considered a Roman citizen? I know by birth, this, uh, he, he was Jewish and uh, probably even descended from the, the Pharisees that, that uh, the, the twelve, the families. Uh, he would have been probably more of that family, 
But would he have been considered a, also a Roman citizen or am I wrong? No, very much so. In fact, uh, um, I forgot what chapter it was. A few chapters ago, I don't think last week, maybe the week before, uh, somewhere between 13 and 15, he, he appealed to his, uh, by using his Roman citizenship. Um, and this was something that he used to his benefit and many times throughout his ministry. Okay. Um, so yes, he, he certainly was. Thank you, Father. That, that's where I heard it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. And after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over the region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater and Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Uh, we hear about Paul now returning to a few of his locations. He returned to Ephesus. Now he's returning to Macedonia. He returned to Antioch. He's doing his return journeys. Um, and certainly some of these regions were places where he wrote separate letters to, like to the Philippians, um, to the Corinthians, um, to the Romans. So he, he is make, keeping this connection with um, many of the local churches now that he helped to establish or at least, at least nurture. Uh, we hear also about some of his travel companions. His most recent one is Timothy here. Um, and then we hear the, uh, the first person plural of waited for us. This is showing that St. Luke at this point is traveling with them. Remember St. Luke is the author. And so he's now participating firsthand in the journey. Of course, the days of the unleavened bread are Passover, um, and then five days and seven days. So you know, they, they, it's interesting. I always w was amused with the, the particularity of them mentioning just how many days. It's like a, a travel log or a journal that they're keeping. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, of course, this is a liturgical reference to a Sunday liturgy. Paul ready to depart the next day. And, and by the way, the breaking of the bread is not just the actual liturgy. They would, of course, break bread for the liturgy. Um, but we'll read very shortly that um, in addition to the liturgy, it was always followed by a meal. This is kind of why we have the practice of the uh, agape hour, because it was known as an agape meal, a, a, a love meal where people would share together, almost like a potluck, bringing what they had to celebrate after the divine liturgy. Of course, the liturgy was not exactly how we celebrate today, but it consisted of uh, something like a sermon um, and reading of scripture, and then the actual Eucharist, uh, which took place after. And we have that same structure to this day. We have the beginning with the antiphons, the epistle, the gospel, the sermon, and then it moves into the liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, okay, so he spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they had gathered together. In a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus. Eutychus. Sometimes when I see the EU, it's hard to not pronounce it as an Ev, because that's what it is in Greek, but Eutychus. <laughs> Who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. My goodness, right? <laughs> this, this poor boy was so uh, so weary and so tired from listening to this very long sermon. Imagine if I sermonized like that on a Sunday, everyone would leave. So anyway, this, he, he fell down. They thought the poor kid was dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. So this is the reference after breaking bread and eating uh, this, this fellowship meal that would take place after. 
and they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. All right, sorry, you want to read a little bit? Sure. Then we went ahead and then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilini. Mytilini. We sa sailed from there and the next day came to or came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at uh, Trogilium. The next day, we came to Milet Miletus. Miletus? Miletus. Or, what was it? I think Miletus. Miletus. Okay, thank you. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Okay. You know, th this section was something that I was referencing earlier. I've, I've read through Acts, you know, chapters 1 to 28 many times, and it never dawned on me that he went to Chios and Samos, and these were two islands where I have family. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool just hearing, you know, oh, wow, St. Paul walked on those grounds. Um, the interesting thing is he doesn't want to go back to Ephesus. Yeah. Why? He knows he knows that he'll be stuck there. He has a relationship with the city. He also had experienced the riot last time he was there. So in order to not be delayed to get to Jerusalem, um, he he avoided it. Now, one thing that I I actually am not a hundred percent sure of, but I believe um, it is what it is that this this day of Pentecost. Um, I'm assuming that it is the Pentecost as we know it in practice, that 50 days after Pascha. And, and the reason why I'm saying this is because they recently, uh, in the chapter before, had commemorated the Passover. However, there is also a Jewish feast that happens roughly 50 days after Passover, um, which is known similarly as, as Pentecost. Now, um, I'm just making the assumption that because at this point he is a Christian that we're talking about the descent or the, the commemoration of the descent of the Holy Spirit. So I would have to do some research into seeing if this is exactly what he is referencing. The only reason why I'm um, a little reluctant to fully go with that is because they refer to it as the unleavened bread uh, making it a Passover reference as opposed to a Paschal reference uh, in the previous chapter. So I can get back to you on that, but... Uh, well, there, at that time, would they still have had Pascha at, at the same time as Passover? Would the calendar have been coinciding at that point? So the, the way that the calendar um, is kind of a, is practiced now happens centuries later, um, like for the West, using the Gregorian calendar happened five, I think, five and a half centuries later, and the Julian calendar happened centuries after. So, uh, the in those days, there were two different types of counting. There was the Greek calendar, and there was the Hebrew Jewish calendar. Oh, okay. I'm assuming that they would have been using the Hebrew calendar, which is, you know, as as today, even with both the Gregorian and the um, Julian, influenced by the lunar cycle as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So uh, I don't know if it's, it's hard to tell because uh, St. Luke wrote towards, uh, or primarily for a, a you know, Greek speaking audience. Uh, he was a, a, a gifted um, Greek speaker and writer. Um, and so based on his gospel, you, we can kind of assume that he's writing similarly in Acts. Uh, you know, if it was Matthew writing this, I would say, okay, he must have been certainly referring to the Jewish feast because Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience. Um, so again, I'll, I'll have to do some more research for that. I just wanted to make the distinction that it's possible that it's going in either direction. Hmm. I didn't even realize that there were two that, that there would have been a, a differentiation at that time. So yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, you want to continue one more paragraph? Mm -hmm. 
from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Hmm. You know what? Um, if, if you can keep reading since it, it's connected. Okay. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. So what we're hearing here is, is you know, a, a, a desire for Paul to show his pastoral love, but also kind of the hurt that came from Ephesus and from his time being there. Uh, he's not disconnecting from them, but he's saying to the elders who have been left there, the, the presbyters, we could assume, um, it's your responsibility now. I spent my time there, I toiled there, I, I gave my blood, sweat, and tears, and, and so now you're responsible. And, and there will be times that there will be those who rise up, whether it's, it's people within the church who are spreading blasphemy, who are spreading false teaching, um, the wolves from the outside, perhaps he's referencing the Romans, um, those who are you know the, the Diana followers, but he's saying, I did all that I could do, and I tried my best to strengthen you, uh, to to show you a way, and now it's your responsibility. And, and he also sh reveals a timetable that he's been at this for three years now, so we can yeah. kind of mark a, a period of his ministry uh, in a sense. Exactly, oh, yeah. and and you know that that's a hefty time um, to be with this community, um, and and then of course at another time we can read Saint Paul's letter to the Ephesians to see how he maintained this. Uh, and, and this connection and tried to encourage them through the dissension that naturally came. Uh, not that he was prophesying this, he just knew from his own experience that this was a very real probability, not just a possibility. Uh, Harry, do you want to finish reading? So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. I think it's a, a very, um, I don't know, very human experience that, that they share and very sweet really in the way that they showed their their love for him as a, a pastoral figure as a, a spiritual father uh, in other words 
Um, the interesting thing is, and there's even a, a note about this in, in the study Bible, um, this, this quote, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It says how um, it references the end of the gospel of John, where he says, you know, should all these other things be written in this book, you know, would, you know the world could not contain, you know, what was written about Jesus or what could be written about Jesus. And so this is kind of the start of this oral tradition. And of course, the oral tradition before we had liturgical books and, and the Synaxarion of the saints um, was really what helped to carry some of these teachings throughout the, the ages. Um, so this is very important. Even from, from early on, we see this kind of entering into our tradition. Um, so now Paul is on his way. Um, he's trying to get to Jerusalem, don't forget. So, uh, we, yeah, we have time to continue reading another chapter. Uh, you know, the past two chapters, I think, have been pretty direct, pretty straightforward, not as, um, I don't know, heavy, heavy laden as the earlier book of Acts. At this point, it's just kind of his journey and maintaining his, his relationships with, with the churches, but uh, there's still some excitement left. Now it came to pass that when he had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course when he came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Batara, and finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, he went aboard and set sail. When he had sighted Cyprus, he passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre. From there the ship was to unload her cargo, and finding disciples, he stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the spirit not to go to Jerusalem. When, he, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken up our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and returned home. And they returned home. Um, there's two things. First is, you know, geographically speaking, these locations are rather close. So even though it sounds like they're they're hitting a lot of destinations, uh, you know, from from uh, Phoenicia, you know, from around Lebanon to Cyprus is not very far mileage-wise. Cyprus to Syria, these are all rather close, and even these Greek islands are close together. Uh, but then we hear about families making this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, kind of this early concept of making pilgrimage at certain holy points of the year um, because it wasn't just men who boarded but with wives and children and the, it, it's very nice to hear that this was a practice that was common early on one thing that's interesting if you uh, want a summer reading book uh, there is a journal by what century was it um i think a third maybe a fourth, third or fourth century um, Spanish nun named Egeria, E-G-E-R-I-A. And much of what we have um, in our practices today were kind of solidified from her journey. And she went to Jerusalem and stayed um, throughout different periods of the year. And she recorded her her experience, the practices that were done, what type of hymns, what type of processions, what type of celebrations for feasts. And because of her journal and, and very thoroughly written as it was, um, we have a, a record kind of a, what was being done in the early centuries, liturgically speaking. So she was offered a major contribution to a liturgical practice. Uh, there are copies in English, um, I think it was first kind of printed in French, but anyway, even the seminary has a copy in English. Was uh, it in Spanish, the original? Was the original written? No, no, but she, you know, at that time, even Spain was, was part of the Roman Empire. So um, I forgot what, what part she was from, but uh, yeah, Algeria, it's, it's interesting. I, I forgot exactly what the book is called, but it might just be the Journal of or something to that. If you just type her name, even on this, the seminary library website, or you'll, you'll find, and if I can find an electronic copy, I'll send it to the, to the list. Um, 
Okay. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemy, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, who were Paul's companions, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Remember, this was Philip, who um, was also known as the, the deacon, who was the one ordained early on in Acts, who helped to baptize uh, the eunuch. And then he continued his way to Samaria. Um, now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. Uh, you know what, um, Sarah, if you want to keep reading, we'll, we'll stop after this little segment. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> and after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning... oh, one... Sorry. Oh, you know, you can keep going. Okay. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, oh, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Okay, so this, this section um, on the bottom about what they should keep themselves from uh, was part of the first, let's say, not, not edict, but the, the first... Um, list of teachings that came out of the council that took place in Jerusalem. I think this was around Acts maybe eight or nine. Uh, this took place early on with James, of course, who was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Um, so now that Paul had gone back to see James, he discussed with him about all of these different Gentile churches that were established. And it was agreed upon that since the children of, um, of Israel did not heed the word that they could turn, uh, the, remember Peter's experience and then Paul's experience and start to, uh, to preach to the Gentiles. Um, to forsake most, just for a moment. Okay. Uh, not the circumstance, okay, let's see. If I could um, again, you know, this, this so that they may shave their heads. I, I'm thinking that this is a reference to um, them being seen as, or being able to be elders in the church or presbyters. Um, I could be wrong, but in the first you know, centuries in the church, 
one of the distinctions of someone who would be ordained uh, would be to have part of their head shaved. And remember, we talked about St. John Chrysostom, how the icon, you know, it's like a funny hairstyle or weird balding pattern. Um, but this was a, a, a sign of this type of um, priestly affiliation. I don't know if it's a reference to that or if it's a reference to, a reference to one of the Jewish customs, uh, because the Jews had customs either about growing hair out, cutting their hair, keeping their hair in certain ways, uh, a one time part of Levitic practice, another time there were local practices like we heard even about St. Paul practicing a, a Nazarene vow. Um, so again, this is something I, I could look into a little further uh, to determine. But anyway, we hear again um, the outcome of this first council and, and these continue to be ways in which uh, the, the newly kind of uh, baptized Christians and, and those who have been Christians already for a few years ought to continue to practice. And it's not a very strict set of regulations. Uh, these are things that are very possible for the everyday person, not to offer to idols, to stick to the Lord, the Lord Jesus, not to fall back on any of these gods or goddesses. Um, from blood, this is really abstain from murder. You know, don't kill people. Uh, this isn't, you know, types of blood from food. From things strangled, you know, this could be, you know, certain types of animal products and how they were killed. Uh, and of course, sexual immorality is self-explanatory. Uh, okay. Uh, Harry, would you like to read a little bit? Uh, then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So there's either, either concern that, pe that Paul brought in those who were impure um, for not being Jews practicing uh, their customs of, of ritual purity, uh, fasting customs, types of foods that they would, would be permitted to eat or not, or you know, perhaps sexual, uh, sexually immoral. Uh, but also, they're, perhaps they're speculating that Paul brought this Greek in and you know, they did some unlawful offering or some unlawful practice that was not for the Lord, but rather was for one of these pagan gods. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. Again, so when, there's, there's dissension among the group, but this is not the second time that Paul was arrested. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness. 
But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying. What a place to end, right? A cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. We, you want to wait till next week to, to continue? Or? Your call, guys. Son. I'm okay either way. Sarah? We can't hear you, Sarah. Sorry. Yeah, we could go a little longer if that's all right with you. Sure. It's hard to, to finish on that point. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Because these were Jews. They were, wow, who is this Who is this man speaking our language? Now, of course, St. Paul did know Greek because he wrote his letters in Greek. This we know. This is historically proven. Um, again, he's using parts of him that can appeal to those in which he's, in whom he's speaking. Um, so he's not being tricky by this, but rather he's being very smart in, in, um, as he, in his own words, being all things to all people. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, who of course was a, a very famous um, Pharisee and one who really was, was austere in the teaching and the practice of the law taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way, meaning the Christians, to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders for whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Remember, this was when he was struck off his horse. He was going to, to bring wrath upon the Jews in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the, the early Christians in Jerusalem. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? Even Paul in his wrath understood that this was the Lord. You know, kind of like how the, not in the same way, of course, not that even in his kind of uh, days of old was he equivalent to the, the evil spirits, but even someone who is deeply defiant of these new uh, Christians, he could perceive who the, the Lord was through his voice and through his address. And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who are with me, I came into Damascus. Uh, Sarah, you want to read? Okay. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul's recounting uh, not only his, his experience as being this, this wrathful Pharisee so that he can make this connection to the Jews in Jerusalem, but that he had this encounter by Ananias, of course, who had the vision to receive him, that he has now, he's sharing his conversion story yet again. Uh, and because of this, he now attested to being baptized in, um, uh, with, with the guidance of Ananias. Okay, now what happened? 
Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I am imprisoned or I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. You know, this is this, this first confession of him uh, being at Stephen's martyrdom. And you can almost hear here the, the repentance that he has for standing by and for, for being a participant. Um, also using this word martyr in Greek, uh, martyr of course is just a witness, someone who um, uh, in, in their lives witnesses, you know, not like you, you see something and you witness, but kind of gave their own testimony through their, their witnesses being um, a follower of Christ. Um, and so this is where, of course, we have the, this you know, early understanding of who the martyrs were in the church. They were those simply who stood by their faith, no matter what would come about them, whether it was social isolation or an extreme form of torture. Uh, okay. And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? See, now, now he switched. Oh, I can speak Hebrew, I'm Jewish. Wait a sec, I'm a Roman, don't do this to me. Uh, but the, you know, what, what made them flip is that he departed so that he would approach the Gentiles. This, this was beyond their, their fathom, mm -hmm. uh, fathoming. Um, so now he's back to appealing to his Roman citizenship. Uh, very, <laughs> very crafty sometimes. All right. When the centurion. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, take care what you do for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Mm. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Now, even there's this distinction between the birthright and this large sum. The sum could have come from time in the, the army since he was a commander. Um, it could have come from a financial appeal. But the fact of the matter is Paul has this, this status that he's able to, to use at his discretion. And also, again, for the ability to continue his ministry and the, uh, his works for Christ. Uh, Harry, you want to read the last little paragraph? Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Now the Sanhedrin, of course, was the, the Jewish body of elders attached to the uh, main temple uh, which came together to condemn Jesus um, and the Sanhedrin we can kind of think of as a, a Jewish council of elders similar to how James led the council of elders in Jerusalem um, I think it's a good good place to stop here uh, we'll, we'll pick up uh, next week with you know Paul's trial uh, of course we know that this, this ends well, um, meaning he doesn't uh, get condemned to death at this point. But uh, very interesting, right? You know, this, this concept of identity, which we see over and over again in Paul. Um, and in his letters, too, we, we see that um, he, he writes to these churches that he's developed this bond with 
um, helping them to kind of grow into their new identity. Identity as Christians from Corinth, Christians from Rome, Christians from Ephesus, Christians from Philippi, that there, there's this new identity in Christ. And so even though he appeals to his Jewishness at times as being a Pharisee and his um, Roman citizenship as helping him you know, in status when he gets into trouble, ultimately it's the identity in Christ that comes to be the most important. Uh, and of course, we see this later on. Right now, he's doing what he needs to do in order to, to survive long enough to continue his work. But it, I think it's important for us, too. You know, even in hearing his letters, there is no Jew, no Greek, saying that the, these identifying factors as just being of an ethnic or religious group should be abolished because in Christ, these things don't matter. Of course, we know to this day, you know, unfortunately, sometimes they do matter. And, you know, some of our churches are more ethnically inclined than others. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, the cultural attachment. It's a problem when it supersedes being an Orthodox Christian. Um, so I think St. Paul would say similar things to us uh, in the church in the 21st century. So it's interesting, though, right? Yeah. Yes, it's just special too. 